Shalom, shalom, Havarim. Greetings, my mishpaha. What's up, what's up, my people? And welcome, friends, to Bible on a Bicycle. Super Cut Stand at it. My name is Will, and I'm an aspired follower of Yeshua HaMashiach. That is Jesus Christ. But what is a Supercuts fan edit, you might be asking? Well, a Supercuts fan edit is where we approach a particular topic contained within the Bible, whether that be one of linguistics, translation, interpretation, theology, creed, or cultural context, whatever the case may be. And we begin approaching these questions raised by the topic by opening up our Bibles delving into the scriptures for ourselves, reading them for ourselves. And then I go out so you don't have to, and I delve through all the nooks and crannies of the world wide interwebs, seeking out varying and often opposing viewpoints on the topic itself by referring to the teachings, preachings, and lectures of various scholars, philosophers, teachers, and preachers, you know, Folks, it's way more educated than myself and way more better spoken than I. And then I take those and I chop, 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 chop it all up and then push it all back together, hopefully into something coherent that we can stand to watch and listen to. And then serve it all right up to you in the form of a supercut stand at it. And in this here particular video, we're going to be taking a look at a very uh, controversial subject. That's the topic of what do you do when you're angry with God? I know that's a taboo subject for many of you watching this here. Angry at God? Well, you shouldn't be angry at God. But is that what the Bible says? So what do we do as believers when we're angry with the Lord? What do you do with that anger? Well, to address this topic, we're going to be listening to the teachings and preachings of two of my favorite, that being the legendary Lee Strobel and that ever so wacky Dr. Tim Mack. So without any further ado, I urge you to open up your Bibles, maybe grab you something to be taking notes on, and I'm going to turn it over to these guys right up here as we delve into that controversial subject of what do we do when we're angry at God, according to the Bible. So grab your tea, hang on. When you bury anger, you bury it alive. It doesn't go away. It leaks out in other forms. Have you ever been mad at God? I mean, maybe your house flooded during the hurricane and you think, you know, God could have prevent, prevented that and he didn't, and so you're, you're harboring some resentment, some anger toward God. Or maybe you're in some physical pain or emotional pain and uh, your pleas for God's intervention in your life have seemed to go nowhere. Or maybe you've been waiting and waiting for God to provide some guidance on a monumental decision in your life, but all you hear is silence. Or maybe you suffered a personal tragedy. If you, uh, if, if you have been a Christian for very long, uh, you almost certainly have had to face the contradiction, what I call it, the great contradiction, what I think is one of the most kind of formidable challenges to belief in God and belief in, in Jesus. And it's both a theology issue, but it's also a very personal issue. And, and that contradiction is this. Contradiction is that we say we believe and we gather weekly and we gather in homes and one-on-one and, -on -one and, and in terms of our own uh, beliefs and convictions, if you're a Christian, we believe that God is good, that he's real and that he's present and that his will and purposes for our world are to heal and to save and that he loves the world and everyone in it. We, we hold that belief. And we hold it not just, not just because we think it's a nice thing to believe, we, we hold it because we can point to examples of God's actions in history where he demonstrated his goodness and his care. Foremost, I can point to Jesus, right? God, God's action in entering human history 
in living and dying and being raised for us. Right? That's why I believe any of this in the first place is because there's a whole bunch of eyewitness testimony that this man lived and died and said and did these things. And so I hold that really firmly right here. And I can point to Jesus and I can say, here's how I know that God is involved and that he acted to save. So I have that in one hand. But in the other hand, you just look at the, you look at the tragedy and the horror of human history and, and of, of the chaos of the majority of humanity's just daily life and the pain. And, and you, if you haven't been there yet, you will come there. You reflect on your own experiences of pain and suffering. And how do those, the two of those go together? It's what I call the great contradiction. And for many people, when, when hardship and tragedy strikes, strikes their lives, they either don't know how to hold on to this belief in God's goodness, or they begin to question it, they let it go altogether, or they alter their view of, of God, and he's God some absentee, distant landlord, or whatever, because where was God in my pain and in my suffering? And if you haven't felt this contradiction yet in your own journey of being a Christian, just give it some time. <laughs> give it some time. You'll eventually be there. Because this isn't just a theology problem, this is part of the human experience in living in a broken world. Today, we're going to tackle the most controversial subject along these lines. What do you do when you're mad at God? Now, just the idea of being mad at God is enough to make some people very uncomfortable. I did a survey among Christians, and about half of them conceded that, yes, there have been times when they have felt anger toward God. But many others reacted like one woman I talked to who said, well, you can't be mad at God. It's not right. I could never allow myself to be angry at God. Now, she did concede that, yes, there have been times that she's been frustrated with God, there were times when she's been upset with God. There have even been times when she's been disappointed with God. But she drew the line at getting angry. It just seems blasphemous to her that you would get mad at God. Now, certainly God is holy. He is just. He is perfect. He is loving. He is all wise. And he never truly deserves our anger. But you know what? There's friction that is inevitable in any close relationship. In fact, the closer you are to someone, the more passionate you feel about them, the more likely there's going to be some friction, there's going to be some anger that's going to erupt as part of the relationship. This is true in marriage when we get mad at our spouse, and it's true in our relationship with God as well. How do you pray through that contradiction? How do you pray through it? And the way you do it, is about one-third, almost 50, of the prayers in the 150 uh, prayers in the book of Psalms, almost 50 of them are prayers that are generated out of pain and anguish of this contradiction. And the way that these prayers, uh, these biblical prayers move through it is through lament and protest. Through lament and protest, you don't deny that you feel this way, that you feel abandoned by God, but at the same time, you don't just sell the farm and ditch the whole thing. You pray through it. What does that look like? What does it mean to lament and, and to protest? Still, the truth is some people are afraid to get angry at God. So some people think, you know, it's blasphemous to get mad at God. Others are afraid to do it because of those kind of reactions that they're imagining. Still others get the impression that being mad at God is the unforgivable sin. Well-meaning Christians have told them, look, no matter what happens, just keep thanking God, just keep praising God, just keep a smile on your face because God has a wonderful plan for your life and he doesn't need you to second guess it. In other words, if you don't feel like smiling at God, fake it. So now we have a problem. On the one hand, we have the fact that anger is a natural byproduct of the inevitable friction in any close relationship. And then on the other hand, we have the fact that many people consider it totally unacceptable to be angry at God, or they're afraid to express that anger. And so what's the natural result? The natural result is that people paper over their emotions. They experience uh, anger because they feel like God is being unfair or he's being silent or he's being unresponsive in some way, but they stuff down that emotion and they post, paste on a phony Christian happy face. 
And that just makes matters worse. Why? Because when you bury anger, you bury it alive. It doesn't go away. It leaks out in other forms. I mean, think about it in terms of your relationship with your spouse. If you're angry at something that your husband or your wife has done, what inevitably happens? Communication stops, right? I mean, let's face it. We don't like talking to people we're mad at. And so we give them the silent treatment. We withdraw. We don't feel like relating to them. Uh, You feel distant from them. And friends, the same is true of our relationship with God. Maybe you secretly blame him because you married uh, someone who claimed to be a Christian, but they turned out to be abusive or they, they walked out on the family. Or maybe you harbor resentment because your parents divorced when you were young and God never stepped in to stop it. Or maybe you lost a loved one and God never prevented it. And you've accused and you've convicted and you've sentenced God because you feel like he let you down at a crucial time. And because you thought it was improper to express the emotion of anger to God, you suppress that emotion, but they haven't gone away. Those emotions have been busy at work in a subterranean way to distance distance you from God, and you, you haven't even really been aware of what was creating that distance. So friends, let me say it as clearly as I can. It is okay to express your honest emotions to God even when you're angry. God is not um, hurt. He's not troubled by the anger that you honestly express. He can handle your emotions. It's not going to threaten him. In fact, it doesn't surprise him. Since Psalm 44 verse 21 says, God already knows the secrets of your heart. He already knows how you feel. He already is aware of your emotions. And if you're honest with him about those emotions, he's not going to strike you down. He's not going to wash your mouth out with soap. He's not going to send you to your room without supper. You see, when we honestly grapple with the pain and confusion and frustration over the difficulties and the seeming unfairness of life, God understands. God understands. He knows that we're people with messy emotions who live in a messy world. He created us. He sent his son to live among us. And he's a God who cares about us. Psalm 86, verse 15 says, But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. What does it mean to lament and protest as a way of praying through our tragedies and our pain? And our grief. What does that even mean in the first place? And then we're gonna we're gonna move through. I think when most of us, I think our default mode of prayer, when there's a crisis, there's something super difficult, hardship enters our our life. I think the prayer kind of mode that most of us get into, at least at least myself, and I've asked others, is kind of this. It's I could just call it request mode, which is the. Uh, Anne Lamott, she says she prays three kinds of, you guys know Anne, Anne Lamott? She's great, kind of essay, uh, uh, nonfiction writer. And she says she has three prayers, basically, which is thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Or help me, help me, help me. <laughs> and, uh, and so essentially, at the, I think the mode that most of us get into uh, when hardship hits is help me, help me, help me. Right? Which is just, God, would you provide a solution, give relief, send this resource that I need, answer this prayer. We get into request mode. And here's what's super interesting about all of the prayers of lament in the book of Psalms is that they do request. They do request. There are requests here in Psalm 22, but it is, it is a really small portion of the prayer. Look at Psalm 22 with me. Just look at the first line. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is that a request? It's a question, isn't it? But it's not a request. It's not a request. Verse 2, my God, I cry out by day, but you're not answering. That's not a request. It's a statement, isn't it? Verse 3, you're enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises and ancestors put their trust in you, so we're still not not requesting yet. Verse 6, I am a worm and not a man. Right, that's a sad self-description, but that's still not, still not a request, is it? Verse 9, you brought me out of the womb. 
Verse 12, many strong bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan, still not requesting. Still, Verse 14, I'm poured out like water. Verse 16, dogs are surrounding me. Verse 18, they're dividing my clothes. Like, what? <laughs> there's, do you see this? This huge majority of, of this prayer, and there's no request. It's, it's anguished, detailed description of what's happening to me and how I feel about it. Then, verse 19, but you, Lord, here come the requests. And they're, they're quite short, and it's just a small part of the prayer. Don't be far from me. You're my strength. Come quickly. Verse 20, deliver me. Verse 21, rescue me, save me. Now, just, just stop right there. Okay. This kind of, I'd never really even thought about this until it was pointed out to me. The, I think the assumption that we have when, when hardship comes is God already knows what's happening. He already knows how I feel. What I need to do is tell him exactly what he's supposed to do about it. Right? That's the assumption I think, that, we, that we are. And you see, this psalm has precisely the opposite assumption. The assumption in this prayer is God knows exactly what to do. Deliver me, save me, rescue me, help me. <laughs> so, right? so God doesn't need help knowing what he needs to do. The majority of this prayer is taken up with describing what's happening to me and how I feel about it. Do you see that here? Now, let's be clear. I'm not saying God deserves our anger. I want to emphasize that. I'm not saying he's done something wrong. I'm not saying he's somehow at fault or that our anger is actually justified. I'm just saying he understands the emotions that we have. He understands when our pain causes us to be unreasonable and to be accusatory. And like a true friend, he wants to bring us through those emotions and to help heal those emotions in our life. He's not condemning. He's compassionate. So we should be honest in our relationship with him, even to the point of being painfully honest. In fact, this misconception that it's bad to express our true emotions to God is, is really a relatively recent development in religious history. If you go back to the Old Testament times, you see some of the greatest men of God that they weren't inhibited in expressing their anger toward him. The, the biblical prayers, they assume what actually God is most interested in hearing is, is me describing how I'm processing all of what's happening to me and how it's making me feel. Do you see? I mean, you can just see it now in the prayer. 18 verses of detailed description of what's happening and how I feel about it. Three short verses of request. Request. And so I just want to camp out here for a few more moments because I think this, is, this gives us an insight that we don't actually know how to lament very well. We don't know how to pray very well in times of, of suffering and of hardship. These psalms are here to teach us how to do that. And they do it primarily through lament and protest. Listen to the angry words of Moses in Exodus chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It says, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on these people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's brought trouble on his people, and you have not rescued your people at all. You can hear the frustration in his voice. God's spokesman, Jeremiah, actually accused God of deceiving him. In fact, he said his life had become so unbearable, he wished he'd never been born. He said in Jeremiah 20, Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. So in other words, Jeremiah, so upset because he claims that God deceived him, says, Curse the day I was born. In fact, on top of that, you know the guy that came out of the delivery room to announce to my father that a son had been born? Curse that guy too. I mean, how do you really feel? I mean, that's... It's pretty strong, isn't it? King David didn't shy away from venting his emotions to God. He wrote several psalms that are called laments, where he pours out his uh, true emotions. In fact, in Psalm 13, he begins by saying, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? 
How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day of sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Do you see? I mean, they're being honest. They're expressing real emotions, real feelings to God instead of putting on a phony front. And guess what? God did not destroy them for it. In fact, God preserved their very words of anger in Holy Scripture. Why? So that you could read them. And you could see it's okay to be honest with God. That he is compassionate. That he is slow to anger. That he is on your side. That he's not going to send you to bed without dinner. That he's going to send love instead. Now, when I say the word protest, a whole bunch of kind of ideas come into our heads that I, I don't think are helpful for us. We think of protests and we think of, you know, there's one every weekend somewhere in downtown Portland for different causes or whatever. We think maybe of, of anger or whatever. And that's anger may or may not play a part in it. But protest is, is, is a different category here, here in these prayers in the book of Psalms. But seriously, we don't know how to pray through our grief. We assume God doesn't, all I can think is that I assume God doesn't want to hear it, that he doesn't care. And so I'm just going to tell him what I think he should do, when apparently what he's really interested in is hearing what I'm feeling and what I'm processing. So, I mean, I would even encourage you, just get yourself into a mindset of a time of where you had to face the contradiction and ask yourself how you could have prayed. Some of you are right now in your life in the middle of that contradiction. What would it look like? Let's face it, there are times when we do feel frustration and even anger toward God. So what do we do when those times take place? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, In your anger, do not sin. So that's a line we, we, we should not cross. In a, we can be angry, but let's not sin in our anger. Well, how do we do that? I want to offer three suggestions for steps to take when you're feeling angry toward God. To pray it through, to think it through, and to talk it through. So first, first thing we do, we pray it through. We pray it through. Now this is a difficult step, step to take because when we're mad at someone, our natural inclination is we don't want to talk to them. And yet, that just makes matters worse because then we're cutting ourselves off from the very God who can comfort us in the pain and confusion that has sparked our anger in the first place. I said, honestly, I don't feel like praying. When you don't feel like praying, tell God about it. I thought, well, that, that makes some sense. To go to God and say, God, I do not feel like praying. And here's why. And then just let it go. Tell them why you don't feel like praying. Because you're mad, because you, you're frustrated, because you're upset. And to let all that out and express that to God. To forget the formality, to forget the these and thous, to forget the theological niceties, to forget being poetic, to forget complete sentences, to forget censoring yourself, to forget trife uh, phrases and cliches, to forget the phoniness, and not to hold back the tears but just to be brutally honest with God. Let's, kinda, let's dive in. We're going to work through, the, through David's prayer here and see how he prays through his, uh, his grief. And there's a thousand years separating David praying this prayer and, uh, and Jesus taking it on his lips, hanging on the cross. And during that thousands of, thousand years, who knows how many countless thousands of Israelites prayed this prayer in their time of anguish and, and need. And so what essentially this little note does is it opens up David's prayer. It's not just about him and it's not just about Jesus. This prayer is for anybody who has ever felt abandoned by God. He begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of my anguish? My God, I'm crying out day. You don't answer. I'm crying out by night. I don't find any rest. There's no description of his circumstances. And so all of a sudden, anybody who's ever felt that, that, that confusing sense of absence of God in your life, this becomes your prayer immediately. And this is how he begins, with how he feels. 
but also a form of protest. It's clearly, if God were listening, he would realize I've been crying out day and, and, and night, so this is not okay. If God were really aware that I've been crying out day and, and night, he would answer immediately because God wouldn't tolerate that kind of thing in his world. So you can see this, there's emotional energy here. Why aren't you paying attention to me? It's not angry protest because who's he praying to? What's the very first words? This is very important. Biblical lament and protest, all it's based on relationship. He's talking to my God. He assumes that he's his God and that he cares and that makes this, the sense of absence all, all the more painful. He cries out, my God. He begins with this appeal. Look at, look at the next part of the prayer. This is instructive. We're going to move through it, showing us what, what it looks like to lament and to protest. Verse 3, he says, you're enthroned as the Holy One. You're the one Israel praises. I mean, in you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you. They were saved. They trusted in you, and were not put to shame. What's he doing right here? Just stop and think about this. What, what mode of prayer is he in? He's not describing how he feels anymore. What's he doing? He's referring to how God has proven his faithfulness in the past. There have been times in the past where people cried out to you, and you totally responded. And, and just think, for David, if, when he talks about our ancestors cried out to you and you saved them, what story is supposed to be coming into your head? This is like the main foundation story of the Old Testament, of Israel's salvation. This is the story of the Exodus. They were in slavery, oppressed. They cried out to Yahweh. He sent them a deliverer, saved them out of Egypt. And so in the, in the midst of his, it's like these contradictions, these feelings. He's saying, I don't feel like you're present. I don't see you anywhere to be found, but I know that you have responded in the past. And so this is a way of, he's not doing self-talk here. He's reminding God that God has been faithful in the past. Why, why aren't you doing that same kind of thing right now? That's a legitimate question. It is. You're not alone in asking that question. And apparently God invites us to remind him of his past salvation when we feel the lack of that presence and salvation in our own lives. Let's keep going. He says, but I'm a worm. I'm not a man. He feels less than human, isolated. He says, I'm scorned by everyone, despised by people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. They say, he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let the Lord deliver him since he, he delights in him. So he takes a deep dive down here into his isolation. I mean, really quite a deep dive. And again, you, you, we get into the thing like, of course, God already knows I feel like this. No, dude, like verbalize it. Articulate it. He, he's feeling deeply isolated. Those of you who have been in, in periods, this often happens um, in, in situations of sickness or, or in death. You lose a loved one. And even, even your best friends have a difficult time knowing how to talk to you. Have, you guys know this experience, or have had this, right? And you're in the presence of someone who's experienced grief and tragedy. Even if you want to talk with them, you don't know how. Tragedy is a very isolating experience, even from people that care about you, much less people, in this case, that are, that are persecuting him and so on. And so he, he just prays right through it. He just pours it all out before God. He doesn't stuff it. He doesn't let him take it over. Let it take it over him. He just, he prays right through it. And then he, he, he instantly moves even deeper. Verse 9, he says, you're the one who brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. Even at my mother's breast, from birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Don't be far from me. Trouble is near. There's no one here to help me. These are some of the most unique uh, descriptions of God, actually, in the, in the whole Bible. God is depicted as a midwife right here. Do you see that? You brought me out of the womb, laid me at my mother's breast. It's a very, so he, he, he knows that God's the author of his life. He knows that, that God's responsible for existence. He knows that God is so close to him and has been since his first breath. And he depicts God as this midwife, this strong maternal presence that's always been with him, 
I know you care about me. Where are you? Where are you? Margaret Becker wrote a song years ago that said, God is not afraid of your honesty. He can heal your heart if you speak honestly. Humble sorrow and the honest cry, he will not walk by. He will not walk away. In fact, God invites our honesty. Why? Because honesty breeds intimacy. Isn't that true? After you've had a spat with your spouse and, and, and you've been angry, and you, but you work it through and you talk it through and you, everything, isn't making up the best time? That's the best part. And so God wants us to be honest because it builds a more solid foundation of intimacy in a relationship. This is deeply personal. And again, I'm commenting along the way, but I, some of, I think some of us, we're like, this is uncomfortable for us. <laughs> we're like, I don't want to talk to God like this. But, but there you go. Apparently, it could be one of the most healthy things for your relationship with your creator is to just really articulate your grief and your emotions and your feelings. Let's keep going. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear against their prey, open their mouths wide against me. He, uh, he didn't just go on a jungle safari. Okay, that's not what just happened. So um, this is a very common metaphor uh, in the Psalms in particular and in other biblical poetry to describe either circumstances that are very uh, hostile or dangerous for you or people who are your opponents or enemies or whatever to describe them in terms of vicious animals. So it seems kind of strange to us, but this is super common uh, in their culture and time. So we'd, these bulls and lions, these are the most uncontrollable creatures that humans can think of. The circumstances seem completely out of control, which is what he goes on to say, verse 14, through these metaphors. He says, it's like I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. It's like I'm falling apart. No coherence and cohesion in, in my mind or heart. My heart's turned to wax. It's melted within me, an image of, of fear. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. It's like this image of him actually being forced down into the dirt. He has no vitality, no vigor. He's laying in the dirt, no energy. He's, a, he's dry, no vigor, no vitality. Dogs surround me. Dogs are scavengers in their culture and time. Not too many people had pet dogs back then. They're wild packs that scavenge. And so here is this dead man lying in the desert. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and, and my feet. Or some of your translations have, they, they hack off or they chop at my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat at me. They divide my clothes among them. They cast lots for my garment. So he's in this place of isolation and pain and grief. He feels like he's dying. He can't hold it together. And what do people around him do? They close in to take advantage of him, right? They're, they're gambling for his possessions and so on. He feels completely isolated and alone. There you go. How you guys doing? That is so intense. <laughs> That's so intense. It's only now that he moves into request mode. And, and quite briefly, he just says, you, Lord, don't be far. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild of the wild oxen. And that's it. That's his request. He assumes that it's much more important to God and to himself that he really articulate what's happening to him and his grief and, and his pain. This is so instructive for us. And I, I, I don't know how to do this very well. And I'm a child of our culture, just like all of you are. I'm guessing most of you don't know how to do this very well. In fact, we might even be kind of scandalized at like the, the raw boldness of talking to God in this way. I knew a man who was a Christian for 17 years, and he got very mad at God because of a, uh, the deep sadness that he felt over a very personal loss in his life. 
And this is what he told me. He said, Lee, I was driving somewhere, and I pounded my fist on the steering wheel and the dash of my car, and I yelled at God for forcing me to give up what I had lost. I cried and I grieved. It was only after that that I was able to talk to God in a more controlled manner. He had to let out that anger, be honest with God, to grieve it. And then he felt, now I can talk to God in a more controlled manner. Now, if you don't feel you can talk to God, send him an email. I don't know his address, but just write, write, write an email or, or write a letter to put it down into words. If, if you can't articulate it, write it down. Times of hardship and grief. This isn't just like about therapy or something. This is about being human, whole human beings and how God's, God's salvation heals the whole of us. When we go through times of stress and tragedy and hardship and loss, stuff happens inside of us that we don't get, right? Things get misaligned and distorted within us that we don't even know how to name. And it seems to me that this, the, the biblical culture of prayer and lament, this is, this is God's way of inviting us to process this isn't therapy. This is just biblical, right? That we're whole human beings. And, and not, this is what's so brilliant. This is in the Bible, you guys. You know what I'm saying? So all of a sudden, these human words to God become through the scriptures, God's words to us about how to speak to God about our suffering. He's inviting us to do this and to name what's wrong, to draw attention to it. And to hold that contradiction together in faith and to say, I don't know how, in this instance, God's goodness and care connects with, with the suffering and tragedy, but it's really messing me up inside and I've got to talk about it. I've got to name it. This is biblical lament and biblical protest. It's not angry, wallowing prayer. It's being honest and pouring our hearts, hearts out before God. It's very powerful. And what this would look like for you to do, I don't know, right? Because I don't know your story. But this is what Psalm 22 and the 50 other prayers that, that are like it in the book of Psalms, they invite us to do. So pray it through in your own words to write it out or to speak it out. And what you'll often find is that this, this very act of pouring out our emotions to God, our raw feelings to God and finding that he doesn't strike you down, but he shows compassion to you, that he's on your side, when we do that, we realize he's not some callous and some distant deity, but he's already made the choice to voluntarily join us in our pain through the suffering and death of his son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. One author said, In Christ, God suffered alone, utterly and completely alone, so that you and I would never have to suffer alone. Now, something really important happens here. Uh, right after verse 21, there's a whole shift in the, in the prayer. And maybe you noticed it when we read through it. It turns from uh, this lament and, and request and protest, it turns from that all of a sudden to praise. Look at verse 22. It says, all of a sudden, I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. And they're like, whoa, what just, what? <laughs> what just happened? So I thought this was, he was in horrible circumstances here. This is very common in these prayers. And, and normally what, most certainly what happened is, you know, we can only speculate. David composed parts of this prayer. These are words that he said to God in his time of grief and anger and, and confusion and so on and pain. But at some point, he experienced deliverance. He experienced resolution to this. And so, at least here, essentially, we're going to see the scene of what he did was he did what you're supposed to do when your prayers are answered. You go to the assembly at the temple and you, you share the story with other people. So he says he goes to the temple, to the assembly, and I'm going to declare your name and praise God. And here's what he's going to say. Imagine David standing in the temple after, after this whole time has passed. And he says, all you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him, you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He hasn't hidden his face from him. He's listened to his cry for help. And so he had, again addresses God then in the temple. He says, from you, 
God, from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows, which usually involved uh, offering an animal of sacrifice to thank God for delivering you. And so he, and uh, normally for those kind of sacrifices, you throw a big party. What an awesome culture. When your prayers are answered, you slaughter like a goat and you have a huge party. <laughs> and you invite all your friends and you tell the story of God's faithfulness to you. This is a part of, of lament and prayer in, in these prayers, is when you find an answer, when there is resolution, when you do uh, discover God's grace and mercy or there's healing or whatever it is, you don't just internalize that. You throw a party. <laughs> you turn to God's people and you have a party. And so he says, the poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. And uh, may your hearts live forever. I think this is actually like uh, cheers, you know. <laughs> this is, they're actually at the feast and he's, he's praising and thanking God, you know, bottoms up kind of thing to celebrate, to celebrate what God has done in his story. So, so again, this is, we don't do this very well and I don't think we even have a category for this. Do you, how many of us have a practice in our prayer life of moments where we invite other people in our lives to celebrate moments of deliverance and answered prayer and coming through that dark night of the soul. Hebrews 13, verse 5, God says, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And so after you vent those emotions, that kind of realization begins to take place again. That, that, that recalibration that God is for me. He's not against me. That even when I express this, this, this raw emotion, it doesn't come back to me in equal anger, but he comes back to me with compassion and love. It, it, it recalibrates us. In fact, I read to you earlier King David's words in Psalm 13 as he begins that psalm with that sense of frustration and anger. Let me read you how he finishes that psalm after he gets all that off his chest. He finishes by saying, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. You see, first he needed to process his anger before he was able to recalibrate himself with God's love for him. And the same is true for us. To just initiate relationships and invite people into your story, especially into your struggles. And this has, this has a way, this has a way of uh, bringing the threads of our stories together and all of a sudden you realize I'm not the only one asking this question. I'm not the only one praying a prayer like Psalm 22. There's lots of other people who are wondering where God is. It's about uniting in, in those prayers together. Uh, he, David ends the prayer, verse 27. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, even those who can't keep themselves alive. And this is the part of Psalm 22 where we're like, okay, that's cool. How did, what does that have to do with anything <laughs> at this point in the prayer? Here, here's what I think what's happening. This is really profound. It's as if David, he thinks of his own story, of this tragedy in his life, where he called out to God, and he just, he had to lament and pray through those emotions and those feelings. And at some point, he met, he met the answer to those prayers. And he invited other people in, and he shared in the celebration of God's mercy and, and grace that he experienced in his life. And it's almost here, like at the end of this prayer, he sees that story of what he went through as just a small, a small little example of the story God is weaving in, in the whole of his world. As he, as he meets the evil and the suffering and the brokenness of our world with his mercy and salvation in people's lives, it's as if his story reminds him of the big story that God has set on redeeming and rescuing his whole world. And so he ends by saying, this thing that I experience of being able to praise God on the other side of my suffering, he sees, he sees that all creation is headed towards this praise on the other side of suffering. And all nations will come and will worship, for he's the king, the rich of the earth, even those who are going to the dust. 
This is the image of death. Remember earlier he said, I'm in the dust of death. He apparently has the idea that God's commitment and his, his mercy, his commitment to our world, even reaches beyond the power of death. That even death can't thwart God's ultimate purposes to save and to heal his people. And so he ends by saying, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness. They'll declare it to a people yet unborn because he has done it. He envisions like this unending gathering of all generations, all bringing their stories of suffering and pain and how God met them and, and delivered them. Just going on, on and on. Ad infinitum. So the first thing we need to do when we feel anger toward God, to pray it through. The second thing we need to do is to think it through. To think it through. By that I mean we need, to, we need to spend some time thinking what is behind this anger? What is behind this emotion? What's driving all of this? Because so often on deeper reflection what people find is they're feeling anger toward God because they feel like God has broken a promise to them. But as they reflect and think deeper, they realize, wait a minute, God never made that promise to me in the first place. You might remember on Palm Sunday, Jesus is riding a donkey into Jerusalem. And how are the crowds reacting? Oh, in adulation, they're, they're, oh, they're greeting him as their Messiah. They're, they're cheering him on. And yet that very same crowd, before long, is crying out for him to be crucified. Why? What happened? They thought Jesus broke his promise to them because they thought the Messiah would be a political Messiah, a military Messiah who would overthrow the hated Roman government that was oppressing them. But Jesus never promised that he would be a military Messiah. He never promised he would be a political Messiah. He came as a spiritual Messiah to break us from the oppression of sin in our lives. He never, he never promised that he would destroy the Romans in the first century. And yet they thought, wait a minute, he's broken his promise to us. Crucify him. And sometimes, you know, you go through a difficult era of your life and you feel like you're angry at God and then you have to step back and say, wait a minute. He never promised me that my life would be free of difficulties, that my life would be free of challenges. He has not never made that promise to me. In fact, Jesus comes right out and says in John 16, verse 33, I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart or have courage. I have conquered the world. So he's not promising that our life will be free of difficulties. In fact, he's promising there will be difficulties. Why? Because we live in a world that is stained by sin, that is encrusted by sin. And so living in this world, in this day, we will have trouble. But then he says, I will give you the two very things you need in the midst of trouble. I will give you peace for the present and courage for the future. My guess is that the second half of the poem didn't resonate as deeply as the first. And that might be for a number of reasons. Uh, some of us might be sitting in the middle of that contradiction in our lives, and we have no idea how or when God is going to bring his deliverance so that I could even invite friends over and have a party. You know? some, some of you have people that you care about deeply who are in the midst of this cry of anguish and they don't see God's faithfulness at work in their story. They don't see their prayers answered. And so what do you do, right? What do you, what do, you do if you head to your deathbed never being able to make it to the second half of the psalm? What do you do? And this is where I think the importance of Jesus quoting this psalm as he hangs on the cross, where it becomes so important to us. So there's something very mysterious and crazy going on. When you read uh, the stories of Jesus' crucifixion scene in particular, there are over 20 places 
where the gospel authors, where the writers draw attention to or use language or draw connections between what's happening to Jesus on the cross and little details in this prayer about the the hacking out or the piercing of hands and feet, about the gambling over the clothing, about the insults that people yelled at Jesus that were very similar to the language of Psalm 22 and so on, and the fact that Jesus took the words of this very psalm on his lips. So what's what's happening right there? And some of us, we think, whoa, that's crazy, you know, unity of Old and New Testaments and predictive prophecy and so on. And yeah, that's totally cool, right? But Psalm 22 isn't actually predicting anything, is it? Like you read Isaiah and there's clearly like a a Messiah is going to come, a king, he's going to rescue the world and this kind of thing. Psalm 22 isn't. It's a prayer of lament. It's a prayer of lament. And it's David's prayer, but it became the kind of prayer that was so powerful because it so just nailed what's going on inside of us, it became the prayer of thousands of others, countless thousands of others after David, to pray through their times of suffering. And and so what Jesus is doing, this is so powerful, what what Jesus is doing is he is taking up the suffering, both of his great ancestor David, but of all the thousands that have prayed this prayer after David, but before him. It's as if he is... He is self-identifying with the suffering of humanity. And so what, what the great paradox of Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is that on the cross, God becomes God forsaken. So friends, don't get mad at God because he failed to fulfill a promise he never made. He never promised perfect health and perfect wealth in this world. But on the other hand, Jesus does describe the Father as a good Father who gives his children what is best for them ultimately and in the right timing, even though we may not understand it because we don't have the big picture. You know, sometimes I think we think we can do better than God. Sometimes we sort of second-guess God and we say, you know, if, if, if I had God's power, if I had his omniscience, I wouldn't allow this certain thing to happen. But wait a minute. Think about it. If you had God's omniscience, if you knew everything, and you had his wisdom, and you had his power, you know what? You would allow the very same things to happen in this world that happen in this world. Why? Because God does have all that. He is perfect. He has the long view. He allows certain short-term things to occur because of a long-term benefit that we can't foresee yet, he sees all that, he allows it, and if you had his power, and if you had his omniscience, you would be God, and guess what? You would make the same decisions that God would make. He doesn't just, like, sympathize with human suffering. He actually self-identifies with it by entering into it. And so what this creates is a space for you and I as Christians to pray the first half of this prayer because we may never see the, the deliverance that we pray for, this side of Jesus' return and the, res- and the resurrection and the new creation. We may never see the full answer to those prayers and those anguished prayers that, that you might even pray more passionately now because of the first half of Psalm 22. But Jesus taking this prayer on his lips all of a sudden gives me me an anchor to hold on to because God did not despise or scorn the suffering of that afflicted one, did he? God did not hide his face, ultimately, from Jesus. Jesus is God entering into our suffering, our anguish, so that he can conquer and, and heal Heal it by his love. I may never experience the second part of Psalm 22, but Jesus did. And as I make my confession of faith as a follower of Jesus, I put my trust in him, I just hang on to him for dear life so that what was true of him in his resurrection may become true of me one day. When I'm angry at God, when I'm distressed and anguished and seething at my circumstances, I think of Christ hanging on the cross for me. He said, this brings me back to spiritual sanity. 
He said, Jesus endured the torture of the crucifixion out of his love for me. He didn't have to do that. He chose to. So he doesn't just sympathize with us in our sufferings. He empathizes with us. And he said, ultimately, I find comfort in that. So the next time you're feeling angry toward God, close your eyes. And picture Jesus hanging on the cross, suffering the torture of the crucifixion out of his love for you, out of his compassion for you, so that your sins could be taken care of and that you might be reconciled with God forever. Think of that. That God, who could react against us in anger, justifiably for the way we sin and we, we, we're, we're selfish and we ignore God and we're indifferent toward others and so, we, we justifiably deserve his anger, but what does God send us instead? You close your eyes and you picture Jesus on the cross. That's what he sent us. Love, redemption, hope, future, reconciliation, peace, courage to deal with what we're dealing with. Picture that next time you're feeling angry toward God. Pray it through. Think it through. And then finally, talk it through. Talk it through. You know, there are tremendous benefits in getting together with others who have maybe walked the same kind of road that you're walking down and they're maybe feeling the same kind of anger or have in the past that you're feeling and the confusion that you're feeling where people sit with each other and listen to each other and weep with each other and pray with each other. But what's most important in this psalm is it's the journey. This is David's prayer, this was Jesus' prayer, and this is meant to be our prayer too. As we look in faith to the fulfillment of God's promises and we can point to the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus as the one, as the one who ultimately was delivered out of the suffering and death that you and I are in the thick of. When you talk to others who are in pain and when people reach out to each other in a time of need, there's healing in that. When you're feeling angry toward God, when you pray it through and when you think it through and when you talk it through, it's like slowly that fist that's in your heart, that fist of anger, that fist you're shaking at God, you know, begins to open up into a hand that now reaches out for what Jesus promised he would give us in John 16, 33, peace for the present, courage for the future. And we will find that the Bible is telling us the truth when it says in Psalm 147, verse 3, God heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. He is there for us. He is a loving father. He is on your side. And he's willing to put up with our messy emotions so that as we work through those, we'll grow closer to him. And we'll find that there is hope, there's a future, there's courage, there's peace, there's redemption in our relationship with him. And so some of you, it might be your own story, where you're in the middle of, of that pain and grief and wrestling with that contradiction. You might have a loved one or someone you care about who's right there. And so, man, just take advantage of this time. Uh, sit with Psalm 22 in front of you, perhaps, and allow yourself to go there, you know? Allow yourself to pray in a way that you never have before that might make you feel a bit uncomfortable, but that God's inviting you to because He cares. He cares. And He doesn't just care. He has actually done something about it. In Jesus, His life, His death, and resurrection. Well, hallelujah and praise the Lord. I know this was a long one, folks, but I think it was a very important one. And I don't know about you, but I found it very encouraging that it's all right in times of grief, times of struggling, times of tribulation and trials in our lives, that it's all right to be angry, to be upset, to be hurt towards the Lord. He knows already. It seems foolish to try to hide your heart from God. It seems foolish. He already knows the anger, the hurt, the suffering that you're going through. So there's no sense whatsoever in denying what you're feeling and lying to the Lord. To me, trying to lie to the Lord's face, well, 
that throws me off a little bit more than just being honest and saying, I'm upset with you, Lord. I'm going through this time of loss, and I know you're real. I know you're real because you, you've delivered me through trials and tribulations. I've seen the small and great miracles that you've performed into my life personally. I have no doubt, Lord, that you're real and that you're capable of delivering me through this. But then we got to be honest when we feel those little pains. When we say, Lord, why so cruel? Why? Why, Lord? No doubts that the Lord is real. I don't doubt the Lord. Not even when I'm angry. It's not a matter of doubt to question the Lord in times of grief. I'm going through a loss personally right now, and I'm struggling with these very issues, these very emotions. When I originally edited together this supercut, I had gone through a, a time that it was a great loss, um, a great trial, and I was angry at the Lord, and I was upset with the Lord, and I was, I was lamentating to the Lord. I was. The Lord answered my prayers, and, and he, he delivered me a flesh and blood living miracle, and uh, he answered my prayer. Now, several months later, I lost that little miracle. And uh, I find myself going through those emotions again. And uh, even though I'm, I'm hurt and upset by the loss, I'm also so, so grateful to the miracle that that loss wasn't experienced alone, that I could be there. So I choose to be thankful for the miracle, the many miracles both small and great, that the Lord has bestowed upon my life person. In times of grief, struggle, and loss, I think I owe it to the Lord to be honest, honest with myself and honest with Him, and to know that He understands. I mean, after all, He's experienced grief and loss and human pain and suffering in much, much greater dose than I or any of you out there watching this, don't be assured and comforted to know that he understands. He understands grief. He understands anger. He understands, but he also promises great rewards in the end. Anyway, I read it all long enough. This is going to be a nightmare to edit. So I want to close this here video out by saying, hey, thank you, thank you. That's right, thank you. Thank each and every one of you. That's right, I'm talking to you right there. You. Yeah, get a little something. Right. Yeah, even you. Thank you for being here and joining me today. I know your time is valuable, and I really do appreciate you spending a little bit of it here with me as we delve into some of the topics raised by the Holy Bible, the scriptures. Hopefully you opened up your Bibles with us today. Got anything out of today's video? You know the routine. Hit that little subscribe button down there if you're not already subscribed. Give us a little love, hit that thumbs up down there. And if you know anyone, a friend or family member that you think might benefit from watching this video or enjoy it, then hit that little share button right down in there. Share it out with folks. The more views we can get, the better here on this little channel. All those little things are just little small things for you. Just take you a second. But it really helps a little small struggling channel like this one here. If you'd like to further support this channel, there's tons of links down below where you can support this here little channel so that I can continue to pump out videos like these or the many others we got here on this channel. And there's also links down there where you can specifically support the ministry we do here locally with those experiencing poverty and or homelessness. And if you're like me and currently not in a position where you can financially help support anything, don't worry about it. I just appreciate you being here watching. Until next time, remember, Yeshua, Jesus loves you. So do I. Get off of here, go ride your bike, and read your Bible.